are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right, folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive in. This episode features myself and voice, stage, and screen actor Andrew Cavadas, and we chat about medieval history, fantasy fiction, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice, of course, music, and more. I don't know about you guys, but as I say in this episode to Andrew, just growing up, if you if you're a kid and you hear that intro to King Arthur and the Knights of Justice, if that doesn't grab you, man, you ain't living. But anyway, as I said in the previous episode, I've addressed the audio issues that some of you let me know about. And this is unfortunately one of the episodes that was recorded prior to that discovery. So again, apologies. I've cleaned it up as best as possible. I've rambled on far enough. So without further ado, here you go. And then, from the field of the future, a new king will come to save the world of the past. Boils and ghouls, this is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> I guess just to get started here, just take us back in time a bit. What were you into when you were a kid? Were you reading a lot of books? Were you watching movies, building forts? Growing up in the uh, frozen prairies of Canada, we had one television channel when I was a kid, and that would be our national broadcaster, CBC. So books were a huge part of my life, as was the library. And um, I really, really uh, consumed a lot of books on the Middle Ages. I was obsessed figured I was a knight or something. I'm not sure what, but I was a bit of a history nerd for quite a while and in a competition with a good friend to see who could read the most, uh, you know, just being ultra cool. I really uh, was convinced I was going to be a writer, actually. I loved reading so much. Was also into uh, pretty much anything fantasy related, I guess, with so if it involved the sword, you had me at the sword part. Beautiful maidens didn't hurt. A lot, a lot of heroic fantasizing was going on, I think. <laughs> right. So what were some things you were reading specifically? Like we were reading Lord of the Rings or anything yeah, like that? Absolutely. Yeah, I ate that up. I mean, I'm uh, 62. So that was published when I was when I was still a kid. And I right. remember a lot of the older kids were reading it. I was a little young for it, according to them, but I, I didn't have any trouble uh, consuming <laughs> it from cover to cover. And then uh, uh, C.S. Lewis books, uh, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The mm -hmm. Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I, I like those as well, but maybe not as much as the more sword-oriented stuff. I don't know what it was with the swords. Preaching to the yeah. choir. Yeah, yeah, well, there you have it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just, I just, had, I loved animation. I still think it's an incredible uh, storytelling format and utilizes a lot of things that uh, uh, film in general should utilize, like uh, dream sequences, you know, jumping around in time. But I mean, animation really captured my imagination. And uh, I had a, a father who was a World War II veteran and a man who oh. experienced a lot of really, really rough stuff who just had a love of cartoons. And that was something we could do together. So 
Uh, she would watch Bugs Bunny with me. And <laughs> he loved cartoons. And I think I, I really uh, <clears throat> developed my love of that from spending time around him and his great sense of humor. Did you ever pursue writing at all? I have. I have actually authored a few uh, screenplays that um, were purchased but not produced, uh, which was always, you know, positive. I was a, a writer on a comedy show for a while uh, okay. here in Canada that led to really great careers for most of the cast on, on it. I actually auditioned as a cast member with original material, but they had uh, already picked their cast, but they, they actually liked what I'd auditioned with and asked me if I had any more material like that and I of course lied my face off and said <laughs> sure you know and I said can, can you bring them in tomorrow and I literally went out and rented a uh, I'm going to date myself seriously here I rented a uh, typewriter a, a, one of the fancy ones where you could correct mistakes if oh. you added in the correction tape and uh, I, I actually pulled an all-nighter and I wrote about 12 comedy sketches and they bought about half a dozen of them and then they hired me as a staff writer on the show. Hey, you can't beat that. No, no. I mean, uh, put your uh, money where your mouth. But that's one of the things I love about uh, show business in general is it's a can you deliver business. Uh, nobody cares what your pedigree is, is can you stand and deliver? And uh, I like that. That's a level playing field to me. You know, it doesn't matter where you went to school, who your parents are, can you deliver? I like that. Sometimes it doesn't work out so well for me, but sometimes it does, you know? <laughs> So were you uh, were you in the theater? Were you a drama kid? Anything like that? I, I was I was actually a pretty major athlete. There wasn't really any sort of drama programs where I grew up. Um, that was kind of something you did on your own. And I was heavily into sports, but not with any parental support or encouragement. So I didn't have the sideline parent thing to deal with. I think for me, the romantic poet in me, like the uh, challenge of sports in terms of the principles of strength against strength and, mm. and skill against skill. But I didn't so much like the culture around, especially as a young male in sports, what we were, you know, go ahead and kill them and all of a sudden it's like, yeah. no, I'm here to score more points than them. I really don't want to kill them. Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> so I was spared all that by uh, having to get, I signed myself up for sports. I, I took myself to the games. I didn't have anybody in the stands and that bothered me a lot until I saw the uh, sideline parents. It's almost a blessing. Me. Yeah, it is. Plus, I, again, I, I I owe it to my father for like, he's, you know, if you're interested in that, then you you go and do that. And to this day, if, if I commit to something, I know it's it's mine. Right. I had uh, no uh, stage parent in my life. I had no intervening, interfering push going on. And I was able to, I don't know, run away and join the circus, I guess, and get away <laughs> with it uh, without you know, being opposed, like a lot of parents might out of concern, you know, what are you doing with your life going into this terrible business? You just, you wouldn't have wanted me working in your bank. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so what did your, what, what did your father do for a living? If you don't mind me asking. My father was a research scientist. He was a, a physicist and oh. uh, he loved uh, peer science and peer research. And he had the mixed blessing of starting a division of uh, the university that he taught at that came up with a few commercially viable creations that were then put into a business that he ended up being the managing director of, which was kind of not his thing, but he was a capable person. So he ended up being the organizing leader of this venture when he's not a business guy, he's a, he's a research scientist, but he did it well enough that that small company it's now, um, it's a pretty major company now in, in our country with a lot of international contracts and so on. And uh, it was those few sort of fledgling creations uh, out of uh, research that uh, led to a long, long standing company with, a, I think, believe that the company my father started in the cold prairies in the middle of Canada after surviving World War II and a few mm -hmm. other horrible things is now the company that still tracks uh, satellite radio. Uh, serious wow. uh, is that can i say that's serious xm uh, and, and a few other things uh even in, up to and including some uh, military applications that are non-offensive they're defensive uh, systems that protect uh soldiers in armored vehicles and that sort of thing very proud of my my father's legacy he had a lot to overcome in life and even though he suffered terribly he was he was tortured uh even lost a hand in the war I never heard my father be bitter or hateful or resentful towards the German people. I never heard my father make a racist or sexist comment or joke. And yet he was a man anyone would sit and have a drink with. And, and, uh, but he lived a life that would put most 
religious people or people who claim to follow a spiritual guide. He lived a life that would put most of them to shame. So he set the bar pretty high. The best thing he did for me was tell me to do what I love in life. And you did. You did that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It was the best. I think that was a tremendous advice and, and in a way kind of tacit permission, even though I think he hoped I'd be a research scientist <laughs> uh, like any normal father might. I was free to really pursue my passion without a whole lot of second guessing, you know. That's got to be a good feeling because that's that's sometimes I can hold folks back. Oh, yeah, because we all want to please our parents, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and if they aren't mature enough to realize that this is your life, they're, they're going to make you jump through some hoops that you're going to later on realize that you, you didn't have to be doing that. So where does the interest start? When do you start eventually trying to, you know, maybe get your feet wet with acting? I'll tell you, honestly, I was the class clown smart ass, you know, I was... <laughs> Luckily, I was good enough at it and not dirty or anything that I would just be clever enough to just stay out of trouble, but just bad enough to be told to, you know, it's time to shut that down. We got a class to do here. (laughs) Yeah. And I was lucky enough to have uh, an English teacher who just looked at me and said, you, you're in a play. And I thought, what? (laughs) (laughs) As soon as I got there day one, I thought, oh, my God. God, this, this is permission to do what I've been wanting to do and doing all along, sort of illicitly, um, where, wherever there was an audience, uh, like a classroom full of kids, you know, <laughs> and uh, I owe him everything. He was great. And, you know, this is a guy who did all of this on his own time and his own expense. There was no program in my school. So he did all of this on his own dime, on his own time, put together shows that were just honestly, I, I once I moved up into the professional ranks, I realized just how good the grounding this this gentleman had given us was i mean it was outstanding standard of professionalism considering it was a high school and it put me in good stead when i when i got out there uh, in the professional world i had already been working for a pretty demanding taskmaster uh, in a really disciplined way which is the only way to achieve anything is the groundwork first right mm-hmm. so luckily the person that that seized upon me was actually very capable and very experienced and uh had it, i guess missed an opportunity in their own life to maybe be an artistic director at a theater or, or a director of a stage and screen you know? but certainly dedicated uh, so many hours of, of his own time and and brought in friends from the professional world to work with us we we would have mm-hmm. an orchestra you know not not a huge orchestra enough to fill out the musical you know uh, elements in a respectable manner you know it was a uh, I, I had no idea how polished and at what level we were working at until I got out into a professional world. I'm very grateful for that, actually. Now, your first step beyond that, was it in professional theater or was it a TV show? Or uh, It was uh, theater. I'll tell you, honestly, <laughs> I, uh, I just marched into this place and uh, I said, I want to talk to the artistic director. And... Uh, he was lucky enough to, I was lucky enough that he just happened to be there overseeing the construction of some sets. And, and he was kind of amused by this young, I don't know what I was, but um, <laughs> I just happened to have a, a piece from Oscar Wilde as one of the audition pieces I did. And I do, I do a lot of dialects. So I did it in a British dialect and I didn't know that he was looking for a young actor to play a young officer from Scotland Yard in his next production. And I just walked in, you know, said, you, you're going to see me. You're going to see me now. And uh, just happened to fluke into him needing a young Englishman, I'm guessing for cheap. And uh, because he paid me way under union scale and it was a fairly substantial role. I was kind of the assistant. It was a murder mystery thing. And I was the assistant to the main detective. And so I was, whenever he was a peer, I would appear, even though I'd have fewer lines and less to do, I would be on stage a lot. And uh, it was great. I I, uh, I stayed undercover as an Englishman through most of the rehearsal period and was working with real Brits. Just to have made a guy fall off his chair when I used <laughs> my real voice. Because uh, again, I didn't know I was being that convincing. I thought they were onto me from day one. I, I just thought they thought I was... Yeah, work at work in my mojo as an actor, right? So that was reaffirming uh, more than any anything else I could have said or done. I'll tell you. Yeah, that's how I got started. I just I I just really knew I could deliver. I guess mm-hmm. when somebody said go, I could. And and from years in sports, I had I was just so performance oriented. Uh, it actually took me a while to realize you can have an audition that hits it well out of the park. You can have everyone in the room sobbing or or roaring with laughter doesn't mean you're getting that part it doesn't mean that uh, and and 
you know, in, in sports, you're either over the goal line or you're not, or you got through the tape first, or as a performer, it's not always the case. There'll be some intangible reason why that other choice was, was better for them. And, and you just got to let that be. And uh, it took me a little while to get, get through that one, because of course, in my mind, I should be casting everything. Come on. <laughs> you know. And uh, <laughs> it just takes a little while to realize that there's just kind of a an alignment of elements that need to take place for you to be cast in something. It doesn't mean what you came in there and did wasn't usable, wasn't great, wasn't wasn't spot on. It just wasn't spot on for this particular job, you know, and, and uh, right. there's an intangible element to good casting that is just an instinctive thing. And it's nothing I have any control over on my end. So the sooner I learn to let go of all of that, mm. the better. Like my job is my three, four, five, ten minutes of unbridled, uninterrupted glory while I'm doing my thing. And then they can decide whether that fits with what they're thinking or not. You know, and, and right. I don't have any control over that. There's no way I can. In fact, the harder I try to push to win, the more I'm likely to botch up something that should have been delivered gently or, or you know, in a different manner. You know, you're only competing with yourself, my friend. So. <laughs> <laughs> You've got foundations in writing and obviously you like being on stage. Did you ever in some class clownery? So did you jump into improv or comedy or anything like that ever? Oh, you know, it just never stops. You know, you get with another group of idiots and you just <laughs> never stop. Like I have a number of good friends. We've worked in animation together for years and, and just, it just never stops the riffing. And the I know comedians are like this. They just, it just, it's a race to the punchline all the time when you're yeah. funny, funny people. And it's the same thing with, you know, endless dialects and it just never stops. And I think that really loneliness in life is is never a lack of company it's a lack of kind and when you're with your kind all of these things just happen organically and uh, it's just funny how, how quickly it happens when you're with the right group of idiots and uh, i'm very fortunate to be an idiot among fools so <laughs> it's just fun when it when it's still at that little kid excitement chatterbox let's see you know let's let's be funny level. It's, it's great. I mean, there's so many things in life that aren't that. Uh, I challenged by a friend who is a stand-up. She would come over for dinner. She was a very good friend uh, of my, my, uh, my wife. She uh, had known my wife for years, but we had just recently got together. And so she'd come over for dinner to meet me. I had never met me. And I'm just riffing away and i don't know that she's i know that she's an actress and she's funny i didn't know she was currently doing professional stand-up so what she did after saying you should do stand-up you should do stand -up, a couple of times is she actually just signed me up for a, an amateur night <laughs> <laughs> called us and said you got to come down here at such and such a time and i got tipped off by my wife and so i got to prepare then i got sick and i couldn't do it i had a really bad cold like terrible and my wife who unfortunately uh, passed away uh, uh, a number sorry. of years ago, but was uh, a marvelous actress and a very talented uh, artist, but she was not known to be a comedian, but she took what I had written and, and went up and took my spot. And she was great. I was, was like mind blowing. I, but she said, I'm going to take this on like a role. And it just like, so then after that, I thought, well, I, I now officially have to do this. Like I can't not, not do this. I have to do this. So I got up and did it. And you know, I, uh, I was never more afraid as a performer than I was. I'm a musician as well. And, and beyond, I was never more nervous about anything than going out to do stand up. And Why do you think that is? I think it's the, um, there's no parachute, so to speak. Yeah, no like, safety net. Yeah. Like yeah. even, even in, in musically, even if you're just solo with a guitar and a voice, one of the other is going to be covering for a mistake on one of the other. You can, you can, you can get away with it. But, uh, but when there's crickets in the room and, and that was supposed to be the punchline, that's... <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But the funny thing is, when I when I got up there, and I should I should really do it again, and, and, but when I got up there, after being so afraid and so nervous about it, I was so at home. I, I was right back in the classroom. I thought, oh my gosh, I know exactly what this is. Because they're, they're, not, they're not inert. The audience is this living presence that you can feed mm -hmm. off of and i just thought hold court here dude like just you know you're speaking you've got the talking stick but there's a whole bunch of people here you can speak for and through and like with and, and it just kind of worked and i got really lucky because i had uh i had this bit about um 
There was a time when the U.S. Army was doing the don't ask, don't tell thing with the soldiers of different sexual orientation. And uh, there was in Alexander the Great's time, uh, actually warrior units that were lovers. They were called warrior couplets and, and they were actually lovers and fighters and it didn't work out so well because a lot of times one of them would get bad, badly wounded or killed and the other one would kill himself <laughs> but my my bit was about uh i can't wait for hollywood to get hold of the story because you know there's some obvious couples like uh, matt damon and ben affleck <laughs> right and and i'm thinking uh i can't remember who the it guy i had a couple of pretty guys together and, and then i said but the ultimate couple would be arnold schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. And the battle for who's on top. It's obvious who's on top. No, it is not obvious who is on top. And and what is wrong with that anyway? You know, and I had this whole thing. And I got so lucky because Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunt double was in the front row. And he sat there, arms crossed, looking like a stone. His, I think the guy's name is Peter Kent. He's a local guy here. <clears throat> he doubled Arnold a lot big big guy and he's sitting there with his arms crossed like just looking like he's gonna kill me <laughs> and then when i get to the first sort of obvious break point punchline he just lets fly with his huge laugh and save my butt in front of this <laughs> room full of people and uh yeah it went well it, it was um actually one of the most fun things i've ever done as a performer and i'll tell you honestly it scares me so much i haven't done it since <laughs> <laughs> And you knocked it out of the park and then you walked away undefeated. Yeah, 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 I'm undefeated. That's right. I'm, uh, and I'm going to leave it that way. Undefeated amateur. Yeah, amateur night. <laughs> but it, it was good, you know, and, and, and I, but I have a lot of respect for that art form. I really do. I think people who are really, really good at that are um, keenly intelligent. And uh, if, they, if they're doing it well, they're uh, feeding social commentary in a manner that actually can influence society and entertain it at the same time and that's not an easy thing to do did you know he was arnold's double during the set i did because i know him from around in, in the film uh, industry uh, oh, gotcha. i didn't I, I didn't know he was going to be in the front row when i got out there i was just glad that he was uh, amused and not uh, upset maybe he told arnold <laughs> the joke <laughs> <laughs> well now i want to do the picture but i i well, Arnold's really emerging as a renaissance man as time moves forward, you know? He's yeah. made some very, uh, very good moves, in my opinion, of late. Uh, one very recently. You know, kudos. Uh, he's uh, come out for the environment. He's, you know, he's done a lot of good things, you know? Oh, Andrew, how did you eventually land your first role on the screen? Travesty, I love that. <laughs> uh, I think I know. It was... Um, Oh, this is quite funny, actually. It was uh, our national network, uh, CBC. It was a show called... Gosh, I hope I'm getting this right. Constable, Constable, and which is a spinoff of another show called The Beachcombers, which was a very successful show about a man who combed the beaches for wreckage and lumber, usually usable timber. It's a job here in a lot of coastal regions. Right. And then they did a, it was set in a small town full of small town characters. It was very popular in uh, European countries in particular, where they don't have kind of scenery and so on that we have in Canada. And, and, but anyway, there was a spin off of that from uh, the local cop, uh, RCMP officer, I uh, can't remember the character's name, but the spin off was Constable Constable. And my first gig was as a, a, a high school dude whose girlfriend he had broken up with and now she was trying to kill him and nobody would believe me because she's this little tiny girl and I'm this big football guy. <clears throat> I had uh, sort of longish hair at the time that I didn't know was part of why they cast me as this guy. I was also doing a play uh, uh, concurrently with this thing mm -hmm. and we were rehearsing and the play was uh, set to open a few days after we finished shooting this TV show. So I sort of worked it out with the director of the play and hadn't really told the TV show that I was uh, doing this other show. But what I did do in a very amateur move is I went out and got my hair cut for the play without <laughs> telling the television production. And when I showed up on the day for the TV shoot, they were not happy that, uh, <laughs> that I had changed my appearance. So the wardrobe sort of adjusted accordingly. They had me in, I don't know what their idea was of what I was supposed to be, but anyway, they, uh, <clears throat> lesson there was um, consult with production before making changes to your appearance. <laughs> I thought I was going to get canned on the spot, but uh, yeah, I got, I think I got in the door on that one because I was very fit at the time and they needed somebody who could 
look menacing, but who actually was the victim, who was the innocent. I, I, I did a stunt. I almost got hit by a car. You know almost, those, uh, almost. You know those jackets with the weather sleeves and the wool and the letter i had yeah 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 yeah. cool jackets on they've got the button cuffs on them and mine mine was open and there was a camaro coming up behind me which is supposed to be her trying to run kill me from behind i'm walking down the road and i'm waiting for my cue you know and they say jump and i hear that button on my sleeve get hit by the front of that car as i leave the ground (laughs) so the only thing hanging lower than all of my body is like there and that got hit by the car. I was probably half a second away from being hit really hard from behind by a car on my first job. So instead, I ended up in a wet ditch uh, and had to change my underwear. <laughs> Undefeated in stunts as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just scared me badly. <laughs> I can't and blame you. I had a fantastic time on my first gig. I really did, despite the fact that I almost got taken up by the Camaro. And again, I just thought... This is just, this is for me. Like, this is, this is what I've been thinking I've been doing my whole life. You know? Not bad for a day's work. No, no, I, no complaints. I've, I've done all kinds of other jobs in my time. And, and yeah, I'm not the guy you'll hear complaining on set about, you know, how the food is or whatever. <laughs> so how did the voice acting avenue open up for you? Again, stupid, dumb luck. <laughs> I answered an ad in the local, uh, you know, every, or most cities have this sort of uh, smaller, arts and culture newspaper with the movie listings or the you know yeah 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 and ours here is called the georgia strait named after the strait of georgia we have coastal islands and things Uh, i thought it was the country music singer (laughs) yeah george Strait. yeah 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 yeah, he's good he's uh, very rootsy uh but i uh answered this ad that said uh we are hosting an animation workshop are you interested in voiceover for animation and i just yeah and it was free and this was the most clever disguised audition of all time. It was actually for a cartoon series on NBC. And they were really smart because they just wanted people to be themselves and just to see what people would come in with. And they ran it like they were teaching a workshop. That's a great idea. It was a great idea because nobody's got that second guessing themselves audition nonsense going on they're just going to go and do what they do and from there <clears throat> we'd had to register and so on and then from there i just i got a call i said you know we this was actually an audition and we'd like you to come in now and read for some parts on this new series and good fortune of that was it led to me playing a character on a captain n the game master uh, animated series based on nintendo and i played a character named simon belmont and i didn't know anything about the game or the guy i didn't know he's supposed to be very 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 uh, stoic and tough and uh, you know one of these guys <laughs> you know like this i'm gonna take you you know one of those very east and I, yeah and i i come in and i do it i what was i say he's a cross between indiana jones and ted baxter mm, good uh, one which which are references from yeah, the Ted Baxter was Ted Knight on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Right, He's, right. I got you. man who always had to have the good angle. <laughs> Is my, how's my voice? Is my voice good? What page do I get my shirt off? No. <laughs> and and um, and an actual guy who can deliver uh, when the chips are down, Indiana Jones. And uh, it's because I didn't know anything about the video game or the, the the following this thing had. And I made him kind of a goof. And I... Uh, was told that the animators had actually based the look of the character on me after my audition and all this stuff. Anyway, it started this internet thing where people either hated what I did with this character or they or they really kind of liked it. And it became this controversial thing, which actually couldn't be better. Yeah, that's great. Controversy yeah. is cash, you know that. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're ruffling some feathers with what you're doing and other people think it's just great, you got something going on there. That's you know, interest. Like, yeah, that's interesting. And it, and it was, you know, it was just a lot of straight up fun. And, um, you know, no offense to any of the uh, tough guy Simon Belmont fans or the goofball Simon Belmont fans. I, I was just trying to make a paycheck and I didn't mean any disrespect to anybody's video game heroes. Blame the voice director. Don't blame this guy. I blame the voice director. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an interesting point, actually. I heard Spike Lee say something once that really resonated, actually. And, and it, I think sometimes we've all seen uh, performers that we know to be very good. And there's just something kind of off, you know, they're not quite, they're still, 
good, but there's and usually they are, I think, well, what Spike Lee said was um, the actors don't cast themselves and they don't direct themselves. So if you see a bad performance in a film, you can't really blame the actor because they could have been replaced or they could have been redirected. I'm not saying that there aren't people who fall short in a performance, but uh, I, it really is. It really is on production to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, they know who Simon Belmont is. If you were not doing it how they felt that you were supposed to, why not speak up? Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> so uh, have you done much anime dubbing? I have. I've done quite a bit. Um, I, I'm terrible with keeping track of any of it, to be honest. And I've been to a few uh, conventions and I'm terrible about attending those too. Because <laughs> I don't know, I I, I I like to leave it at, at the office. You know, I, I, I like to have... I have a few friends who are actors, but not all my friends are actors. And, and I don't always want to be talking about show business. And, right, right. You know. But having said that, there is there is that whole sort of, this is my tribe thing that happens when we get together. So I can't remember the question again, but you did ask me about voice work and there was a point that that long rambling story. Uh, as Simon Belmont, <clears throat> I ended up doing this cartoon and we're in the studio recording and we have to stop because Aerosmith is in the studio next door recording Pump. No, Shit. Again, it was, what, the 90s, I guess? While we're stopped on a break, the engineer has just kicked the doors open so there's air in there, and he's got the booth open as well. Uh, it's summer, and because this is all new to me, and I'm a musician as well, and I'm working with a beautiful Neumann microphone, I say, well, I'm going to stay in there while you guys go on a break. I'm just going to play on the mic. Is that okay? So he leaves the mic up for me. And I don't know he's left the booth uh, speakers up as well. And so I get on there and I'm doing Sean Connery impressions and I'm doing all this stuff. And again, the idiot's luck here. The door is open and I'm doing my Sean Connery impression. It's probably not very good, but I'm just, I'm up on the mic and I'm, you know, so what do you say, money, penny, or whatever? Loosen that blouse and see how many pennies are going to fall out. You know, I'm doing some nonsense on the mic. The guy across the hall comes out of the, the every engineer room across the hall, and he's listening at the door. And he comes into the, the room where I'm on the mic, and he says, we need a James Bond for tomorrow for a campaign. Can you come in at such and such a time? We'll give you a quick audition. I think you're in. Boom. Next day, I did, I don't know how many ads uh, for this campaign, like just blind dumb walk into it well but the thing is the point is i was very again being myself doing what right. i would do which is to get up close and do something stupid on the microphone <laughs> uh, and um, i think that's key to all of this journey through this career any anytime I'm, I'm trying to hit some mark that i think they want to see or hear this is just not go well but if i just come in and do it to please me the way i think it should be then that's the job you know Right. You just mentioned you're a musician. What do you play or do you sing? Or I sing uh, better than I play. And, and uh, I'd say that as someone who's fairly confident, I'm a pretty good vocalist, but I play, I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I did an album a number of years ago where I played everything except the drums, which I'm not going to recommend. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now I, I like to actually produce other people. I have a, I, I'm sitting in a little studio that I have right now and um I play uh, guitar, piano, and uh, guitar and piano, and more guitar and piano, <laughs> and, and some really bad drums with like maybe two basic beats. But basically, uh, can manage my way on most things with strings or keys if you give me enough time in the corner to work it out by myself. And, uh, but mostly for me, it was I'm a singer and a songwriter. I was in a number of bands and ended up writing most of the songs in every band I was in and uh, got uh, one of them into a film a few years ago. Modest success here and there with it. But now as, as I'm older, I realize it's just, I mean, music is just its own reward and it always will be, you know, whatever time you have that you spend absorbing yourself in, in anything creative is, is, is therapeutically worthwhile. But I think music above all art forms is, is the most therapeutic for me anyway. Now, what style of, uh, or genre do you play or listen to generally? I just like really good songwriting. I don't really care what genre it's in. For me, the lyrics are very important because I because I'm also a player. I can put it. I can put a chunk of chords together with a break and a bridge, and you know, play you a little solo. And so what? You know, <laughs> that should all be supporting a narrative melodically. And 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 uh, once somebody's put some 
poetry over top of that. Uh, the lyrics to me are very important. What's being said and how it's being said. I don't know. I like songs from all over the place uh, if they're good. But I guess I, I, I don't know. I like artists that kind of mash styles sometimes, I guess. Okay. Uh, or, or push the boundaries of the style that they're working in. Of course, I'm trying to think of examples now. All right. Five albums on a desert island. Which five albums are you oh. taking? Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, well, I'm going to really seriously date myself. Sergeant Pepper would have to be there. Beatles. Mm -hmm. Five albums. Okay. Joe Cocker did an album a number of years ago. Uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen was a film at the time. I don't know if that's the title of the album. I think it was the album that You Are So Beautiful is on. And there's a track on there that you need to hear if you're a musician. If you've never heard this song. I dabble in bass, which is easy, you know. <laughs> oh, I love, playing, I love playing the bass. I love playing the bass. I really enjoy it. In fact, that's something I should do more as a singer because a singing bass player, is a, that's a really good place to be. Yeah. You got the root and the melody. Exactly. It's, there's a song called uh, The Moon's a Harsh Mistress that if you've never heard Joe Cocker sing that song, you, you need to look that up if you want to hear. Let me write a, it down. Let me write it down. Just a soul-rending Say it one more time. The, the moon's a harsh mistress, or the moon is a harsh mistress. I can't remember the title. No, I should know the album title, but I can't remember the title of the album. But those two tracks are, are on that album. So that's two The Beatles, Joe Cocker. I'm going to have to get some Bob Marley in there. You know, I, my, one of my first CDs I ever bought myself was a Bob Marley CD. But how do you pick? Okay, down to two. Yeah, you see. Now, while I will listen to heavier stuff, it wouldn't be on my Desert Island picks. Down to two. I'm a huge classical music fan, so I'd have to have Beethoven's third in there. You got to wind down sometimes. One. I'm probably in, in, in real life, it'd be another Beatles album, knowing me, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll just throw a monkey wrench at any one of the Monty Python albums. Ah, there you go. There's five. It's good thing you didn't ask for 10. This would be a four hour interview. Yeah, we'll be sitting here for a while. My first experience with your work, if you can't tell, was probably uh, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice. Oh, my goodness. Which, for my, which for my money, is the greatest cartoon theme song of all time. If that doesn't bring you in as a kid, you're not going to oh, watch yeah, any cartoons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was. That was fun. That was around the same time as Captain N, I think, or a little after. I think it was shortly after that. Yeah, no, no. That was a great show. It was a lot of fun to do. Was that just your typical, you know, come read for us or yeah. how did they just yeah, get the yeah. gig? An animation had been established a little bit in Vancouver at that time. So we were, as performers, kind of on the map. There was, I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I think this was the first time uh, one of our own had been promoted to the uh, director chair. Uh, Mike Donovan, I'm sure you, you've heard his name in the animation world, mm -hmm. was instrumental in um, bringing us in, you know, or, or you know, helping choose whom, whom to bring in in the first place. And then, yeah, it was a shootout from there. We had to audition and, and uh, I came out as Arthur King, which is interestingly uh, my, my initials, AK, and uh, also uh, obsessed with the chivalry. So for me, it was like... Uh, yeah, and at the beginning, you mentioned your interest in medieval history. So that's yeah. interesting as well. Yeah, and the Arthurian legend was a big part of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, that episode with Arthur in the Crystal Cave yeah. Uh, where they go to rescue the I got to play uh, the real King Arthur and Arthur King. So I got to have scenes with myself, which is an animation is always fun to do. <laughs> because if you'll recall, Arthur uh, was British, trapped in the ice, and along with the rest of the knights. Yeah, but I, I thought that was a really cool show. You know, I, I like those little uh, elements we had in there too about attributes of character, you know, loyalty, friendship, <laughs> devotion, you know. Because I don't know, I mean, for little kids, a lot of this, we just, we don't say things we need to say sometimes. We just think it's inferred, you know, and, mm -hmm. and hearing it come from a larger than life source like the television with a positive uh, reinforcement for uh, developing character. I just, I'm happy to be part of something like that. You know, that, that to me is, is a good day at work. Any time you can talk about a project 30 years later, it's successful, you know, or it's stuck, yeah. it's stuck in people's heads. Well, it's great to be part of people's childhood memories. You know, that's really, a, that's, a, that's a privilege. You know, that's a, that's a real honor to be part of somebody's childhood memories like that. That's, I don't know, that's, that, that's worth a lot and, as a performer. So out of all the projects you've worked on, Andrew, uh, which one has kept you up the most at night? Which one made you pull your hair out the most? 
Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> he did an arc of episodes of iZombie a few years ago. I, I came into that show not really knowing the show. I did a bit of homework like I always do before I have an audition and was like, wow, like this thing is like out there. You know? <laughs> and uh, I think I got a little too married to uh, my idea of how my character should fit into the, how the story was because I'm instrumental in sort of the whole thing winding up and and the kind of the whole reason for my character to exist is for to wrap up loose ends on a series that they've been doing for a while and just want to you know close it up and, and of course I've got all these other ideas for <laughs> and it, was, it I found it hard I mean everything up to and including um I had a really long wild out of control hair at the time which is still one of my trademarks <laughs> And uh, I thought, okay, well, I'm playing a four-star general. I'm going to get this really good military haircut. No, they, they wanted me to be a little bit loony and out of control and have my hair. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't want to be the actor who can't work because he doesn't have his haircut. But uh, I, don't, I don't get it. I'm supposed to be this military guy. But, I, I, you know, I, I found my way into it. But I was just always just feeling like, oh, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about it in retrospect? Have you watched the footage? Or uh, back at it? In retrospect, it's always the same thing. I mean, <laughs> anybody else is going to watch it and see a guy who's a four-star general, and I'm going to see a series of mistakes, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, it's, well, you know, from what do you, when you're playing your bass, you know, like every little clam you lay out there is to you is the loudest thing in the world and nobody on the dance floor heard it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to your voice acting, do Many times in your career, have you worked with directors that have let you riff a little or improv a little in the booth? Do you prefer that style? I'll tell you the good ones do. They really do. And um, we actually had a director replaced on uh, that first series, Captain N, I was talking about. Just we'll call it a conflict of styles. It's very hard on the cast. A lot of yelling, a lot of pounding on the console. Mm. Uh, I, did, I didn't hear it as, I didn't hear it as rancor or anger. I heard it as like a, like a, like a, like a overly zesty chef in the kitchen, yeah, you know? yeah. but still it's just a little oppressive, you know? And then he, when he got replaced, he got replaced by this guy who was a st stand-up comedian um, for a living who would just let us riff. And mm. it was fantastic. It was really great because you, you we would have to, of course, do the scripted lines, uh, but then he'd say, have you got any other endings? Have you got any other? Because of course we're in there. Like I said, the clump of idiots is together, so we've got a million ideas. I personally, I think that's the way to go, whatever end of the media you're working in, uh, the film, television, theater, theater, you're not going to want to riff, but there's still going to be ideas that people who are, are in a particular capacity of creatively may have that might not be their quote unquote department, but could be a stellar suggestion if you just hear it out i mean you you can always say well that's not going to fit because we're doing this over here and also in fact uh, i was on set once wearing a futuristic onesie and uh it was like minus one and i just i wanted to go home <laughs> and i was noticing the way my character was a, a leader of a squad of other people in futuristic onesies and uh, i had this long speech to the troops kind of thing and then there's these cutaways to the um the main characters who were sort of supposed to be in my pep rally thing here, but we're kind of talking about some controversy off to the side. And the way it was structured, uh, they were going to shoot these chunks of me talking and then over to the peeps and then me talking and over to the peeps. And I just went to the director and I said, why don't, why don't I just do the whole thing? And then you can insert, he says, well, you have to time it because they have to cut me off. There's some interrupt. And I said, well, I, I can time it. Let's just try me. Let's try one. And they said, well, it's kind of complicated. There's like four or five scenes overlapping. And I said, well, let's just try it. And, and uh, he actually thanked me afterwards because they saved him about four hours in setups and a whole lot of time. And, and uh, he didn't have to know that. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And it's just, uh, it just, he was smart enough to just listen. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he could have just said, no, that's not going to work because we need to, da, 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 da. but instead he just went, oh, yeah. We must be tired. Why aren't we doing it that way? So, I mean, it, it, it was, I, I, I don't know. I often do that. I'll just speak up if I have it. I mean, if somebody says no, I'm not going to be wounded or anything. But if, right. I don't, if I don't say anything at all, then I, I, I'm not being genuine. I'm not, a, there it is again. I'm not, I'm not being me.
I talked with uh, Richard Stephen Horowitz uh, recently, and he's a he's a voice actor and he's a voice director. And he says that a lot of voice actors and voice directors don't have fun. And that's really what it's yeah. about. If you're not having yeah. fun, it's not going to be good. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. In fact, one of the best directors I've ever worked with, Peter DeLuise, I, very great, terrific sense of humor and an incredible people skills. But he, he, he said, he said, look, if a director is not funny, the, the comedy is not going to be funny because they're, they're the conduit to which all this passes, you know, and, and uh, luckily he's very funny and has a great sense of humor and timing and all the rest of it. And it's just so easy to work with someone like that who you don't feel like you even have to suppress your punchline that's right there in the tip of your tongue because there it is, you got to say it because it got to be me. But in some environments where you just, you can't, you're just, you're getting, you're constantly just getting shut down, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I think it shows. Uh, on in the end result you know and, and when you what's the thing i was talking about before if you see actors you generally know to be good or you're listening to voice actors you know to be good and they're something's off they're, they're not mm. having a good time they're not right, having, they're not right. enjoying the process you know i mean they'll be professional they'll deliver a, a acceptable and usable performance but there's that intangible piece that's missing and that's the that ghost the soul <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. Well, Andrew, I'm not going to keep you all evening. I guess we'll wind down with these two here. What's the best advice you've received in your career? Do what you love. Do what you love. Maybe maybe you love opera singing and you're terrible at it. Maybe you don't want to pursue it as a career. But if you are lifted from this plane into another place and exalted to a, a, a soul-clearing purification from the experience, sing your heart out, man. Do what you love. Well said. What is on the horizon for you? Anything coming up? Anything in the pipeline you can talk about? Uh, well, I've uh, been very fortunate to be uh, tapped to be a uh, dialect coach here and there uh, because I have a long history of doing dialects. And I just was recruited, I guess is the word, uh, by a conglomerate of uh, uh, dialect coaches who were putting together a, a group where we could we could actually spell each other off and so on because we're all performers as well and um work with you know younger uh actors usually i had a job uh, on an apple series uh keeping a british actor sounding american there was very little to do because he was so very very good at, at doing the dialect but the few times i had to come in to save the day i think i justified my existence and just <laughs> just subtle things like in north america we'll say a uh, helicopter and, and English will say helicopter because it's spelled helicopter. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it'll jump on your uh, North American ear and he, he won't hear it. Flawless through this whole speech. And uh, then because the, the dialect coach didn't coach him on helicopter, you got to do it again. I enjoyed that. Um, I'll probably continue to enjoy that. I, I have some music projects on the go right now. And uh, I have not auditioned in a couple of years for uh, camera work uh, due to the ongoing health circumstances and so on and, and just kind of a personal choice to take a little time out but i'm looking forward to getting back in there i would like to pursue more comedy and i might even do that stand-up thing again yeah i hope you do well i'm too old to be relevant now so it doesn't matter anymore <laughs> <laughs> go there and break a leg <laughs> yeah thank you sir thank you andrew it's been a pleasure talking to you my friend uh, likewise justin yeah uh -huh. well, i appreciate it and uh all the best to you and your future pursuits i didn't ask you anything about yourself well i am a writer obviously i will run the podcast we talk to folks but we're currently i'm working on a audio drama adaption of the unnameable uh it's anyway it's a horror franchise from when i was a kid there were two films released i am writing the audio drama adaption of the third bringing back the original folks from the movies to can't do their voices oh, so that's, that's so awesome yeah, that's coming out in october that's awesome yeah i'm really hyped about it just sent the final scripts out to the voice actors today actually oh that's wonderful oh that'll be fun Thanks for asking. Uh. Yeah, well, let me know. Uh, shoot me a link or something when uh, when there's uh, something to hear. I for sure will, and I will send you a link when this is up. Yeah, well, thank you, sir. I'm much obliged. You have a great day, sir. You too, Andrew. Bye-bye right. now. Bye now. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop 
the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.